Good evening, everyone. Good to see you back this evening. I hope you had a good afternoon. And I'd like to encourage you to come back Wednesday at 7 also for our midweek services. We had a pretty good turnout this morning in regards to attendance, which is good. But I always like to continue to see these church pews fill up and people here that want to worship our Lord and Savior just like we do. So uh, if you know of anybody, just you beat somebody, tell them about us and, and invite them here. That's the only way sometimes we can get people here is just to invite. We did have three prayer requests come through this morning. The first one was, you know, was on behalf of Glenda Barr. Um, a friend of hers, Jody Clark, is asking for prayers for their family on the passing of her mother. And also uh, for Glenda's cousin, Laverne Mosley, who is a member at Westside Church of Christ in Hugo, and she's recovering from health issues. Also, Carla Huff's granddaughter, Kay, We'll have our tonsils removed next Wednesday in Ohio. So please continue to keep uh, Carla's granddaughter Kay in your prayers, if you would. And also Lyndon, Lynn Delcamp's friend, Marvin Thompson, is going to have to have open heart surgery sometime soon. They don't know the date yet, but he's having some serious complications. April the 16th, Lynn just said. So if you would, please keep Marvin Thompson in your prayers. And also, I just had another prayer request. Uh, also, Melissa Morris, uh, her fiance, Lyle, is going into the hospital uh, for surgery. Don't know what, what, what kind. So if you would, please keep this gentleman in your prayers. And also, Jen Elms' aunt had surgery today. Uh, there's some complications with it. The doctors think there could be some internal bleeding, possibly. Uh, we're going to continue to look at that and monitor that. So if you would, also keep... Jen Helms uh, aunt in your prayers at this time. Uh, they said uh, all men's meeting is this going to be this Wednesday evening. If you would attend that, and also some announcements that we have in the bulletin. If you haven't been, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, it's on the inside. Uh, the thirty first of March, which will be after services, we have our egg hunt for Easter, and then April the twentieth is a third Saturday uh, fellowship and that'll be here at Northside and also uh, Linda Barr will be holding a friend and family day at the inter, uh, at the activity center on the 13th and that'll be from 9 to 5 and if you're willing to help out with that or let Linda know if you would that you'll be going her phone number is there as well also on 27th of March will be the young families meal also, the 29th and the 30th, which is next week, we do have two families that will be attending Lads to Leaders, and that will be at the Omni Hotel in Fort Worth, and that will be the Moore family and the Welsh family. And the, also, there will be some other members of our church going down there to uh, help out. So if you can, if you see those people, please encourage their young, their, their children, and uh, wish them a good luck, a good job. Um, if you've never been to one of these contests, it gives you hope that we are going down the right path and that there will be future leaders of our church uh, to carry on after we have stepped aside. It's, it's an amazing event, ladies and gentlemen. It really, really is. So if you would, continue to remember the people who are in our prayer request as well. Sometimes this, link, this list is short and sometimes it's long. But as I always say, if your name was on here, you want people to pray for you because that's the most we can do for each other. Just pray for each other. I thank you for being here this evening. Sam Kilpatrick will have our opening prayer. Mr. Blake will lead us in song leading. And then Caleb will have our closing prayer. Once again, we appreciate you being here this evening. Good evening. Hope y'all all got a good Sunday rest. Uh, if you would, please be standing. I know some of y'all probably got some naps in today, so you got to get up and you know, wake up a little bit so we can praise our God. <laughs> you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. 
seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You were my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You were my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You were my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, Most gracious, dear Heavenly Father, we come in prayer tonight thanking you so much for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifices that were made on our behalf. We thank you for him. We thank you for all the blessings that you do for us, Father, each day. We pray, Father, that you be with us each day, that we may prepare ourselves and to be able to have a home with thee in heaven. We thank you for the tools that you have given us, the Bible that we have, to be able to come here to worship thee. We thank you so much for that opportunity. We thank you so much, Father, for the Lord's Supper that we can commune with thee every day, uh, every Sunday. We thank you for that opportunity. Father, we pray for those ones who may be having procedures this week or upcoming procedures. Pray that you be with them. We pray that you be with those who are having difficulties with their health. Pray that you be with those individuals and the doctors that minister to them. We ask you, Father, to forgive us when we fail you. Help us to do those things that is right. Help us to be righteous. We pray, Father, that you be with us and protect us from Satan's temptations. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon forged against you will prevail. <clears throat> and heavenly armor will enter the land The battle belongs to the Lord No weapons that's fashioned against us will stand The battle belongs to the Lord And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord And we sing glory, Honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of His blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, Power and strength to the Lord, we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses and hard, do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, 
power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Amen. Number 71. Have the deer. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you amen song after the sermon is going to be number 76 Thank you, brother. All right. Yeah, we're good. <clears throat> good evening. <clears throat> Wonderful to be with you tonight. This is our... Uh, fourth message on the subject of Calvinism, and uh, we're going to do things just a little bit different this evening. Uh, we're going to spend less time, uh, we'll look at the statement of faith that they have regard to the, the subject of irresistible grace, and then uh, we'll consider the fact that that's actually a bit of a problematic statement, uh, but then we'll actually just go into passages of Scripture that re reveal very clearly uh, that God's, we have a responsibility to receive the grace of God and that we have just as certainly the ability to resist it. And um, it's always, we'll see, it's always been this way and will always be this way because we are free moral agents. And that just simply means that we have the power to choose to do right. We have the power also to choose to do wrong. We don't have the right to do wrong. The, the word right is very misused today. What about my rights? Well, a right is actually permission, and God doesn't give us permission to do wrong. But we most definitely have the ability to make that choice. And we'll talk about uh, some of these things as we go through the discussion uh, let's just review that the word uh, TULIP is an acronym uh, wherein each letter stands for a tenet or a principle of Calvinism. And this serves as the basic framework of the faith. And as we've mentioned, uh, this is uh, various aspects of Calvinism permeate most of the denominations with which we're familiar. And uh, again, as I emphasized last Sunday evening, uh, these folks who are so often members of these various churches uh, are sincere, and we're not questioning that at all. 
And, and neither are we pursuing, you know, eternal judgment with regard to them. That's God's business. That's God's business because he's got the power to do that. He has the responsibility to do that. I don't, okay? Uh, he didn't grant me that. He didn't make Tom Russell or the Northside Church the judge of the world, right? No, that's his business. Our business is to proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our business is to be ready to defend the hope that is within us. Our business is to help correct uh, any error that we come into contact with that we can reasonably address, right? And, uh, and, and then just simply, you know, content ourselves with that. Let God take care of the rest of it. Sometimes what we find out, and maybe we personally experience, uh, maybe we were raised confused about a few issues. I know I most certainly was. And when the truth was presented, it seemed it was contrary to what I had been taught and therefore what I was convicted of. But it's kind of interesting that if you have an honest and an objective heart, that when the truth is presented, it'll work on you. It'll just, and sometimes I think it's even on a subconscious level. Those things will be in the back working together, uh, the facts working to assimilate themselves in a reasonable order so that we can recognize the truth. And then one day we'll go, I, I see it. It's just as clear as can be. Uh, and so we want to give those that we're in discussion with you know, the benefit of the doubt and exercise of patience with them. It's very possible that when you present the truth to another, it's the first time they've ever heard that. Uh, I mean, they'd never heard it before in their life. And so we just want to move. Typically, we want to move slowly and patiently with someone. So the T in TULIP stands for total hereditary depravity. Uh, U is unconditional election. L is limited atonement. I, which we'll be considering this, ir uh, this evening, is irresistible grace. And, of course, P is perseverance of the saints, uh, with which we'll close next Lord's Day evening, if he's willing. Uh, total hereditary depravity, babies. We, are all, uh, we all inherit the sin of Adam and are totally depraved and therefore unable to respond to the gospel message of Christ. You're going to see in just a moment, that this makes their statement concerning irresistible great, irre, their statement related to irresistible grace really problematic. You'll see what I mean when we get there. Uh, you is unconditional election or predestination. Uh, as we've mentioned, the Bible most certainly does uh, teach predestination. It's just not this. God had a master list of those who will be saved and those who will go to hell before creation in Genesis 1-1, the list is unchangeable. That's not true. Um, predestination is discussed. I mean, it's mentioned by name in Ephesians 1. Uh, but what has been predetermined by God is that any who would be saved will be saved through Christ. Not who can enter Christ, but that those who do are saved through Christ. Okay? Okay. L, as we discussed last Sunday evening, is, is limited atonement. Christ did not die for all men, but only for those on the saved list. In spite of the fact, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Hebrews 2.9, that uh, Christ tasted death for all men. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. I mean, we see this over and over and over again. I, irresistible grace, that we'll be considering in just a few moments. There we go. God sends the Holy Spirit only to those on the saved list, which removes their depraved nature inherited from Adam and creates within them a saving faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit, thereafter, guides them directly to understand and correctly interpret the Bible. Be amazing if it was that easy, wouldn't it? I just got zapped by the Holy Spirit, and I have perfect understanding of the Bible at this point. I've never known anybody who had that, you know. So many problems with uh, these conclusions. And then we have, of course, the perseverance of the saints, and we'll get to this uh, next Sunday evening. A child of God once saved cannot be lost. Of course, once saved, always saved. Um, you know... My message last Sunday evening was a bit confusing. And I got to thinking about 
why that is. It, it couldn't be because I made it confu confusing. You know, it couldn't have been that. You know, it probably it probably was that. But I did want to say uh, that this evening I'm going to spend less time on the proof texts that are often used to defend these positions. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because I, I think that that contributes. I certainly could have miscommunicated. I often do. But uh, it's very possible that the proof texts that are presented give such pause because they don't communicate a message that demands this conclusion. And I think that's confusing. Well, of course... It, it really should be. And it's very predictable that it would cause confusion. If we're adhering to something that's contrary to the Scriptures, then we're going to find that that position, that conclusion that we're adhering to and promoting is going to contradict the Scriptures. If it isn't from the Word, it's going to contradict the Word. And what you find, and we see this, we, we, we see this in every man-made religion, where an initial position is taken. Well, we're all guilty of the sin of Adam. Well, and then it works like this. Well, if that's true, then what effect would that have? Okay, uh, and if that effect is in place, then what about this? And it, it just becomes so disconnected from the clear teachings of God's Word. You're going to see that next Sunday evening in the once saved, always saved, the perseverance of the saints. I mean, that is so obviously contrary to what the Scriptures plainly teach that you just start scratching your head. How in the world could you come to that conclusion? Well, they do that because it's a natural extrapolation from their initial premise, like total hereditary depravity. And if we want to hold to that, then this must be true. And then, well, this must be true. And what you see is their doctrine just more and more diverges from the straight line of the Scriptures. Now, that's something that we can all get caught up in. We need to be very, very careful about it. Uh, I've been mistaken about things before. I'm sure you have as well. But this is why we, we see these things. And then, and this is where it, it, we see a very regrettable effect or reaction, I should say. Any number of times throughout the years, I have had elders from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, knock on my door. You probably experience the same. And they're all about 18, 19, 20 years old. You know, I, uh, I wish I looked like that when I, if I ever serve as an elder. You know, he, he still looks like he's 20 years old. He looks like a kid. Well, they are kids, aren't they? I very quickly, I'll always talk to them. I'll very quickly ask them this question. If I'm able to show you where the Book of Mormons contradicts the King James Version of the Bible, which they believe is inspired, would you be able to accept that? Would you be willing to accept that? That there is an obvious contradiction between those two inspired works, because, of course, they believe that the Book of Mormons is inspired as well, and uh, Doctrines and Covenants, and there's a third one. So if I'm able to show you where this inspired book contradicts this inspired book, you believe, would you be willing to acknowledge that contradiction and acknowledge that your church is in error. I have never gotten one who was willing to do that. They don't even want to look. See, that's the telling part. They don't even want to see that. It's not one of those things, really, please show me. Because I assure you that's how we would be 
if someone were able to show us, you know, well, this is, you know, this is what the, your congregation, your church holds to. But if I was able to show you where it's in error, would you be willing to accept that? Please show me right now. And I mean, I'm sincerely saying that. If we're in error, please show us. We, we, we can fix that, Sam. We can fix that right now. Because we live to do the Lord's will. We live to hold to Jesus Christ. Not our error. If I'm able to show you, I would tell them, contradictions within the King James Bible. And they're there. Because the King James Bible is a what? A translation that was translated, if I'm not mistaken, by eight different groups of six individuals each. And they didn't always translate the same words the same way. For instance, sometimes you see Easter, other times you see Passover and so on. And it's very, very interesting. They will never take me up on that. And what that reveals to me is, well, what they'll tell me is, well, I would, I'll reach out to my bishop in their local congregation. I've had one tell me, well, if you were able to show me that, I would reach out to one of our apostles in Salt Lake City. And I said, well, if I was able to show you, and, and he could not refute what I showed you, would you accept it? And he said, no, I wouldn't because I would trust in his greater spirituality. Oh, okay. And then I had one, and this is kind of unusual uh, for Mormons. He said, uh, no, I wouldn't accept that because the faith that I have, I receive directly from the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Well, that's, that's more closely associated with Pentecostalism uh, than Mormonism, but okay. I mean, you, you know, in other words, they didn't want to be dealt with, and that's okay. That's okay. We try. That's all we do. God calls us to faithfulness, not results. And you never know. They might walk away from that. And a year from now, that challenge might cause them to ask questions and begin digging further. That's all we can do. Uh, I'm not ever discouraged by it. It's always been this way. But what it reveals is that people can get so caught up in their group, their, cult, their, their religious culture, their traditions, that they're unwilling to look at anything that contradicts that. We want to guard ourselves against that temptation. We want to always be willing to consider the word. I, I, I've been mistaken before. The truth of the matter is I've been mistaken many times. I've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, it's, it's quite possible, believe it or not, that I don't know everything right now. I could be mistaken. I always want to be open because you never know, but that that person that you're talking to has greater clarity on that particular issue than you do. Yeah, let me look at that. And then I'll look at it. Doesn't mean I'll instantly accept it, but I'll sure give it some serious thought and I'll get back with them. That's the way that we want to be. So let's get into irresistible grace. Although the general outward call of the gospel can be and often is rejected. The special inward call of the spirit never fails to result in the conversion of those to whom it is made. Well, there's a serious problem for them with that statement of faith there. Let me see if we come up here. There we go. This special call is not made to all sinners but is issued to the elect only. The Spirit is in no way dependent upon their help or cooperation for success in His work of bringing them to Christ. In other words, they don't have any part to play. If you're of the elect, then you received that faith from the Holy Spirit of God directly, and you had no part to play in the matter with regard to accepting it. It is for this reason that Calvinists speak of the Spirit's call and of God's grace in saving sinners as being efficacious or invincible or irresistible. For the grace which the Holy Spirit extends to the elect cannot be thwarted or refused. It never fails to bring them to true faith in Christ Jesus. This, of course, as we've drawn from the five points of Calvinism defined, defended, and documented 
Presbyterian from uh, the Presbyterian uh, Reformed Publishing by David Steele and Curtis Thomas. Well, before we get into this and look at some passages that really clearly refute it, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, something that I think is problematic. I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Give me just a moment. Let's go back to the very opening statement they had. There we go. And let me bring it up online. Okay. I don't know how many saw how contradictory this statement is may, is with the tulip tenets of faith, especially total hereditary depravity. Although the gen general outward call of the gospel can be and often is rejected, that call is this gospel, the call of this gospel, the written word. So although the general outward call of the gospel, the written word, can be and often is rejected, the special inward call of the spirit never fails. The problem is when they say that the outward call can be and often is rejected. But the implication of that statement is that at times it isn't. Well, do you see the problem with that? It, if you are born totally depraved, as they've told us, we're incapable of then even desiring to do right, then you could never respond to the outward call without the inward call of the Spirit. And if you receive the inward call of the Spirit, which is irresistible, you could never reject the outward call. Do you see the problem they have there? Sometimes the outward call, the written word, is, can be, and is rejected. Well, it, it couldn't be. Because if I'm totally depraved, and it's possible for me to receive it, it can only be that I have received the inward call, which is irresistible, and therefore I, we will, I would always accept the outward call as well. You see the problem they run into. This is, this is the thing that we run into when we begin to diverge from just the simple statements and the clear communication of the written word. We run into these conflicting things and find out, well, I, I see that. Well, how can we explain that? Well, let's me and Barry and Larry sit down and we'll come up with something else to try and, and it just becomes a patchwork, a patchwork of catechisms and articles of faith and these things that originate from our imagination and not from the Word of God. See, you look at that and people go, well, that just, what I just read seems so complicated. Yes, it, it is. It is. And it's also, it's also contradictory of the principles that it promotes. The truth is much simpler. Let's look at it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. How often we see that. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of Christ. I have never received an inward call. And yet, I love my Lord. I love my family. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I do good. You are witnesses of that. You know me now. I've been working with you uh, for six, seven, eight months now, however long we've been together. You've seen that. But you see, the problem is that if I didn't receive the inward call according to the definition of irresistible grace, then I am totally depraved, incapable of doing good. And, and so you would look at me and say, that ah, Tom, man, he is just bad. What's he bad in? Well, he's just bad in everything. I mean, he's just a bad guy. In fact, everybody is. 
we got a congregation full of bad people. Why? Well, because they didn't receive the inward call of the Holy Spirit. And someone says, well, you received it. You just don't know you received it. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> well, what do you think it would be something that you would be aware of? Because it tells us, didn't it? Doesn't it tell us that when you receive it, you know all things with, relate, with relation to scriptures? I think I would have picked up on that point. It was the most amazing thing. I was, I was 22 years old. No, actually, I was 17, and I thought I knew everything, you know. No, I was 22 years old, and I was walking along one day, and I received that inward call, and there was instant, complete understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, actually, it didn't work. Never happened. Never happened. I don't think it ever happened to anyone here. No, we heard the word of God, and we heard it again. And we understood it a little bit better. And we heard it again and again and again and again and again. And then we, we meditated on it. We prayed for understanding. So we're not trying to say that God has placed no part in this, uh, that, that God can, doesn't work with us. No, we're not suggesting that. But this idea of direct faith that can't be resisted is simply it's not found in the word and it is contrary to the experience of every godly person I've ever known okay faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God <clears throat> I don't have this passage down but Titus 2 verse 11 and 12 for the grace of God I remember irresistible grace for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men Grace is good favor. So the good favor of God has appeared, bringing salvation from sin, not to some, but to all. It's there for all. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire. To live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present age. Well, I see people who are doing that. And without exception, I could ask you, why are you doing that? And you'd say, well, that's what God wants me to do. And I'd say, well, how do you know? <laughs> you know? How do you know that? And every single one of you would say, well, because this is what it says in his word. You see, n not a single one of us is relying on some inward injection of faith and understanding. No, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. And what the Lord tells us, is that we do have a choice in the matter with regard to whether we receive it, accept it and submit to it, or, or not. It's always been this way. Man has the free will to accept or reject the call of the Lord. A passage that we're all very familiar with, some of Joshua's closing words in his life. Joshua 24 and 14. Some of you probably have this on a wall in your house, don't you? Yeah. If I could, how many, how many actually have this up on a wall in their house? Anybody got it up there? Yeah. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose. You see, they had the power of choice. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my household... We will serve the Lord, for He is our God. Now, well, okay, but maybe, maybe Joshua had that inward imputation of faith directly by the Spirit. Well, then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. What's necessarily implied in that statement? That they had the capacity to forsake the Lord, that they had the capacity to forsake the call of the Lord, to reject His will, His law, His way. They did. And they said, far be it from us to do that. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore... We also will. You see, they had a will in the matter. This is what we're going to do. We will serve the Lord, for He is our God. 
Now, why were they going to do that? We will serve the Lord for he is our God. Why were they willing to do that? Well, because they received this direct imputation and faith on the part of the Holy Spirit. No, no. They tell us why. For it is our Lord God who brought us up and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. They're doing it for that reason. Who did these great signs in our sights? They're doing it because the signs that they witnessed and because he preserved us in all the way that we went among all the peoples through whom we passed. You see, he kept them safe. And for that reason, we're going to serve the Lord. And the Lord drove out before us all the people and the Amorites in whose land we live. And for this reason, because God did all those things, we know he is our God and we will serve him. You see, it's always been this way. It, it, you can't look at uh, or take those principles that we've been looking at in the TULIP acronym, the principles of Calvinism, and say, well, that's only applicable today. No. If total hereditary depravity began with Adam, it was applied to all people and these people as well. And they reveal very, very clearly that they had a choice in the matter. Jesus mourned the fact that their children refused to heed his call. Listen to him. I mean, I wish we could all take a few weeks and go over, just really study and prepare ourselves and then, and then fly over and just tour the area just around Jerusalem. That's what we do on the first trip. Let's just tour Jerusalem. And we could stand on the ground where the Lord was when he overlooked the Temple Mount, when he overlooked the city of Jerusalem. And he said this, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. You see, the message was sent to them. What did they do? They killed them, just like they would him. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you could not because you hadn't received that special message from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's not what it says, does it? You would not. The God of heaven, the creator of all things, the Lord of Lord, the kings of the King of Kings, the one who had Roy, he had all authority, longed for them to do this, and they would not. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They would not. They had a choice in the matter. Ah, that's, I mean, it couldn't be any more clear. And, and we understand this from our own personal experience because there have been times in our lives when we would not obey the Lord. That was when we sinned. And then we heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and we believed it. And our conscience, having been afflicted by our sin, led us to receive and accept it. We repented and confessed Jesus Christ as the Lord and not ourselves. I'm not the God of my life. I, that, that was abundantly clear in the continuous train wrecks that I was involved in and the same was true concerning you. And so then we were buried with him in baptism. Why? Well, because that's what the evidence of the word demanded. And we chose to submit to that. Some have argued in the past. Think about this one. Is Jesus Christ Lord? And we go, well, yes, of course he is. Well, a Lord is one who has authority. Isn't that right? Well, yes, I, I would agree with that. You would agree with that. That's what the word Lord really means, one having authority. Well, Christ has all authority, doesn't he? Oh, yes, absolutely. So if he has all authority, then you have none. And therefore, you do not have the power to choose. Oh, bless their heart. <laughs> oh, they got us with that one. That's, that, one's, that one's deep there. Brethren, listen, it's not a question of who has the authority. It's a question of how he chooses to exercise his authority. Could God have chosen to exercise his authority in this way? 
where you have no will in a matter. You were all, we were all born to be condemned for all eternity. Of course he could have done that. Is it possible that God could have created us and with, without the ability to morally discern right from wrong and that our existence would not ever extend beyond this physical existence? Well, of course he could. We have evidence of that all around us, don't we? That's what we have with the animals, right? God could have done the same with us, but he blessed us with the capacity. He, we are made in his image, possessing the ability to reason, to assess evidence, to make moral decisions. He wrote his law, Romans 2, 14 through 16, upon our hearts so that we might know the correct action to take. And if we fail to do so, our heart is afflicted by that failure which causes us to long to restore our relationship with him. And then he made provision through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and made that restoration possible. Hmm. The Lord said, you would not. They had the ability to choose. So do we. The person who hears and believes is best is blessed excuse me john 5 24 the lord said truly truly i say to you whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life and so belief is dependent upon hearing the word of god one can refuse to confess him one can deny others believed in him but for fear of the fair Confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Okay, so brethren, they heard about this Jesus of Nazareth, and they believed that he was the Son of God. They believed that he was their Messiah, but they refused to confess him. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit hadn't operated directly on their heart. No, that isn't what it says. They refused to confess him, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So there's nothing about a failure on the part of God to send His Spirit directly into their hearts to produce the faith that would have led them to confess Him. No, they refuse to confess Him because I don't want to get kicked out of my group. I don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. It tells us exactly why they refuse to confess Him. They had a choice in the matter. What did they choose? They chose man and not God. That's where they failed. They chose man and not God. It was, it was completely and perfectly their responsibility. They were fully conscious, aware, cognizant of what they were doing. And they chose, I want to be a part of this group, and so I will not confess it. Though I know, I know, I'm absolutely convinced, trusting conviction, that He is the Son of God. You see, the word can be rejected. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him because he had no choice in the matter. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's not what he says, is it? If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. The word, that, <laughs> the word that Christ spoke, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the law of liberty, the law of faith, Romans 3. Okay, that will judge him in the last day. Judge him in the sense of condemnation for what? For rejecting the word. The word that is being rejected will be the word that's used to judge the man who rejects it. It has nothing to do with God failing to operate directly on his heart it has everything to do with his rejecting the word that he heard. That couldn't be more clear. Hebrews 6, verses 4. We'll go through verse 8. For it is impossible to restore. Hmm, we might consider this passage in perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved, you know, next Sunday evening. For it is impossible to to restore, to restore, excuse me, again to repentance, those who have once been enlightened. Talking about Christians here. 
who have tasted the heavenly gift, they heard, they believed, they were convicted with saving faith. They tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. If, after having experienced and made the choices that they did and exercised the righteousness that they put forward, if they then fall away, it's impossible to renew them, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. You, you see, these are those who were saved. I mean, it's just undeniable. You just, <laughs> it's necessarily demanded. This, he's talking about Christians here who've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and how it's impossible to save them or to restore them if they fall away since they're crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. Now, let, let's take a moment and step away from Calvinism for just a moment and talk about Hebrews 6 here for just a second, okay? Because we can become very confused about this. Does that mean that once I have obeyed the gospel, if, if I fall away from the faith, that it's impossible for me to be renewed again under any circumstance? Well, if so, then, uh, you know, Rome, what we considered this morning, then why would you be coming to me? What about Galatians 6.1? If a brother is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, go to such a one with a spirit of gentleness and restore him. Well, but it doesn't look like that's possible. It's not under the circumstance described here. Notice what he says. For land, and he's speaking of the heart of the one who has fallen away, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it, that's the blessing of God's word, words of encouragement, might come from your brothers and sisters in Christ. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Okay? He's describing a particular circumstance here in which it's impossible to restore someone. What's the circumstance? The circumstance is that a brother is caught up in sin and he refuses to repent. It doesn't matter the appeals that are made. It doesn't matter the prayers that are offered. It doesn't matter the efforts that are made in order to uplift him, to shame him into repentance. And there's certainly a place for that. No, he is not going to follow the Lord. Well, that being so, him being a free moral agent, it's impossible to renew such a one. He's rejecting the rain. He's rejecting the word. He's rejecting the blessings of God's influence. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, so long as someone abides in that attitude, there's not a thing in the world that you can do. You can't, you can't force someone's heart. That's what's being referenced here. But getting back to our point, you see within the passage, a choice is made throughout. The blessings of in godly influence are rejected. And so long as they continue, a person continues in that rejection, it's impossible to restore them. Why? They received... Our friends have argued in the five points of Calvinism that this, this person, this is a Christian here. It's undeniable. He has tasted heavenly gift and so on. He's received, if there was an inward call, and there's not. But according to their argument, if he's a Christian, he had to have received that inward call. And now he's rejected it. That's impossible. The grace of God is irrevocable. The grace of God is irresistible. And yet we've got someone who's doing a pretty good job of resisting it right there. They're outright rejecting it. You see, so many passages just clearly, clearly emphasize personal responsibility in the matter. And I'm thankful for that. I, we have a choice in the matter. We can choose to hear God's Word. We, can, uh, we talked about this just a few Sunday evenings ago. I became emotional about it because it's just so it's wonderful. We have a choice in the matter, brethren. We can change. I don't have to continue in the sin waiting for, well, you know, I wasn't, I'm not on the the favored list. And so the Holy Spirit's never going to come to me. It's never going to come to my wife, to my children. 
We're all lost down through the generations. No one that I love will ever be saved because we don't get that direct operation of the Holy Spirit. And God's Word says, no, that's not true. Hear the call of the Gospel. Believe it. Repent. Submit to the Lord in loving obedience and I will save you. What a wonderful message. That's a wonderful message. We have a choice in the matter. I don't, I don't have to be in sin. I don't have to be depraved. I don't have to lie, steal, murder. I don't have to be a drunk. I can be right with God. What a joyous thing. What a joyous thing. What a joyous thing. That's the truth. God's grace is resistible. That's true. But God's grace can be accepted by anyone who's willing. And that's wonderful. Lesson is yours. If there's anyone in need of encouragement, if we can uplift you, we can pray for you, please let us know. Come forward while together we stand and sing. <clears throat> oh Lord my God when I am an awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with 
with a shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you were not able to this morning, uh, you can go to the back and there's been uh, the cup and the, yeah, it's been prepared for you. I just had a, a brain too, so <laughs> it's the lights, I'm telling you, it just throws your mind off. I don't know how Tom does it. <laughs> All righty. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. None else can heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one, no, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Amen. Lord, we humbly approach your throne. I first want to give you thanks for allowing us to wake up on this beautiful day. And Lord, help us to see that we are truly blessed to be able to gather in your name without fear of legal persecution or death or other harm that we may face in other parts of the world as Christians, just as well as your people. Lord, I want to ask a special prayer of healing for everyone in attendance tonight and everyone else that was not able to 
arrive. Lord, help us to always remember that you are king, Lord of lords. Help us to remember that it is your plan and not ours. Help our political leaders and all other leaders as such look to you for guidance and seek your wisdom so that they can help better run our country, our jobs, our streets, and anything else they may be in charge of that you have put them there. And Lord, help us to remember that at the end of the day, you are king. It's, it is what you want, not ours. Lord, help us to remember that as we depart tonight. And Lord, help us to always grow close to you each and every single day as we continue to read your word and continue to study it. Lord, help us to always remember that you are king. In Jesus' name, amen.